Hello and welcome to Time with Pastor Otago, our interactive discussion program that brings scripture to bear on the biggest issues of our lives. My name is Albert Okran, welcoming you on behalf of Dr. and Mrs. Otago. Last week, we began a very important discussion about spiritual fatherhood under the theme of the African church. And we promised to be back to this. So here we are again. And it's my joy to welcome, leading the discussion, Pastor Mensa Otabu. Pastor Otabu, good to see you. Good to see you too. Were you surprised at last week's reaction to the topic? I think we are, we are saying something that is useful to people. So uh, we thank God that it helps. It would seem that the more we talk, the more there is to explore on this important subject. Well, uh, let, let, let's trust God that it will, it will help people to do things a little better. Let me welcome my colleagues, Pastor Eric Hermek, who is ICGC, Open Heavens Temple. Pastor Eric, good to see you. Good to see you, Pastor Last Albert. week was awesome. Thank you very much. It was awesome. Right. And Pastor Priscilla, no, no, get here, ICGC, Eagles Temple. Pastor Priscilla? Thank you, Pastor Albert. It was a blessing last week. A great blessing. Doc, last week you helped us to appreciate the fundamental problem with the nomenclature of spiritual fatherhood. Let's move on today to pioneers. So let's look at people you've publicly celebrated as fathers of contemporary Christendom, like Billy Graham, Pastor Deboe. How do we situate them in this whole discussion? Positions and relationships are not always the same. So when somebody is described as a spiritual father in a positional sense, we're just recognizing their major contribution to the development of Christianity. And the idea of a spiritual father uh, started from the early church and mostly from the first disciples of the apostles of Christ. And they began to start reasoning about the Christian faith and, and, and carrying on the work that had been started by Christ and his apostles. Those people were called church fathers. It doesn't mean that the, the rest of us are church sons. It simply means that those people are, are honored for the important role that they play in, in Christianity. And, and there are contemporary people, as you mentioned, like Billy Graham, uh, who played uh, major roles and in, in the life of the church. Uh, so w when we say that they are fathers in ministry or in faith or in the church, uh, it is not to say that the rest are then uh, their subordinates or their children. It's just a position of honor that is given to them. So will it be about institutional contribution rather than a personalized relationship? I mean, there, there are people who, who contribute in very significant ways, either uh, in opening uh, a certain space for Christianity, like Billy Graham did in evangelism, and taking the gospel to places that were very difficult for the gospel to go to. Uh, he was able to preach in countries that were shut to the gospel uh, and accepted across board as a, a, a very important voice for Christ. And, and, he, and yes, because of that, so many people uh, patterned their ministries after him. So he, he's played a very important role, not from the organi necessarily organizationally, but in terms of the outlook of the church, uh, people who play such roles. But, Doug, there are also a number of founders and general overseers who have lifelong relationships with the senior they regard as an apostolic figure or as a mentor. What I want to know is, do such relationships also have a tenor and a specific purpose? Uh, it, it, it does and it does not. I mean, th there are people who call me their spiritual father, although I don't call them my sons or daughters, but they recognize that I play an influential role uh, in their lives. It's just a positional uh, title. It's, it's, a, it's a position of honor. Uh, that does not give me power over them and does not place me as a superior over them. Uh, so in, in that sense, a Christian leader can have uh, another leader they look up to uh, and once in a while probably take counsel from or never take counsel from, but somebody whose life inspires them. And so they see them within this 
scope of a father. I have no, not much problem with somebody being seen as a father, but I have problem with a father supposedly seeing everybody else as a son uh, and as, as a subordinate. That's, what I, I, that's why I think the relationship can get into trouble. But uh, if, if we want to honor people for important roles they've played and we think that calling them a father uh, is, is the honor, that, that's fine. Uh, but it has to be defined that it is not uh, a perpetual relationship that consigns some people to uh, sonship uh, for the rest of their lives. But then it shows that even though general overseers and founders may be up there, they occasionally also need someone to talk to and to counsel them. Everybody needs somebody to talk to, but not necessarily somebody who is above you. Uh, you know, if you are president of a nation, positionally you are above everybody. But you talk to people. You seek counsel for people, sometimes even from your driver or from, or from an old schoolmate or somebody whose ideas you trust or an expert in a field. And, and you talk to them. They don't become your bosses. They don't become your fathers. It's just that you bounce off ideas with them. So um, I think if we just accept that everybody at a point talks to somebody and seeks clarity, guidance, direction from the person, it helps us so that we don't uh, then see that relationship in a superior and subordinate kind of uh, life. How can a pastor, especially at a developmental stage, draw from a fountain head the enormous benefit of spiritual oversight without getting into the, the issues of spiritual fatherhood? I can look at how I grew up as a Christian. And sometimes I think that God, God orders our steps because of something he wants to do with us. And when I was growing up as a Christian, um, I didn't have anybody who took any particular interest in me. And the people who showed the slightest of interest did not have much confidence in my potential uh, because of what they have defined as what potential was. I wasn't loud. I wasn't dramatic. I was uh, an easy-to-overlook person. So I had to grow by myself, learn by myself. Uh, study by myself, pray by myself. Uh, yes, I was in a church. I had a pastor, but really he didn't mentor me in that sense. So based on that, and I think I turned out not abnormal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so based on that, I, I just feel that sometimes we, we overstretch some ideas even if they have validity, we overstretch them and make them so compelling that it will seem as if, if you don't have this, then you can't have that. That kind of regimented, compelling, either or mindset is what we have to uh, address. You know, God raises people in different ways. There are a lot of people whose books helped me, and, and I, I didn't know them. I just read their books and, uh, and studied under them uh, because of their writings, and I didn't have any relationship. So to answer directly, you can have a relationship with somebody without ever physically meeting the person, uh, and, and, and you, can, you can grow a, a healthy Christian life uh, that way. If you are privileged to have uh, an encounter on a one-to-one -one basis, on a close basis with a, a leader you admire, it may be a bonus. It may be a bonus because you can, in reading a book, you don't ask questions. So now you can ask the person questions and you can get answers and you can get more clarity. Uh, and, and I mean, th there are benefits to that. But I don't also want us to overstretch it as if, if you don't have that, then your whole Christian life is going to be abnormal. When you have God the Father, you have Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, you have what it takes to, to, to do it. Doc, let's deal with the issue of access. There are, I will admit that at, at your time, you were a pioneer, obviously. So for many young pastors, they will say, once I have 
a pastor and have others who have gone through the mill in that way. I could benefit from learning from them. Last week, you mentioned that they could, they could find a way to reach out on a specific issue and get guidance within a certain time frame. Some would say that access is a challenge because the person is genuinely busy. What, what can they do? Thank God that these days, almost every preacher has, leaves behind a body of knowledge. Uh, people have a lot of information on YouTube, a lot of information uh, on Facebook, uh, CDs. Uh, people have l- so much we can learn from. Uh, and so we can learn from that. If they've written in a book, you can learn from that. Um, I think people have a sense that physical contact with somebody releases a certain impartation, and they want that impartation, and they think that if they get physical access, the person would lay hands on them, pray for them, make a declaration over their lives, and, and, and things will happen. That is also one of the truths that we overstretch. The whole idea that somebody can turn your destiny in a very positive direction simply because they laid hands on you, I think it's a very, very overstretched uh, concept. Doc, once you mentioned that, let me ask you a very famous, I mean, there's a very popular practice in charismatics where you meet an accomplished person in a particular field, either in ministry, marriage, and you say, I tap into that grace, I tap into that anointing. Would you say it's out of place? I mean, I mean, it's, I, I hear people say it. I mean, people say to me, I'm tapping into, and I'm, I'm, I don't know what they're tapping into. <laughs> you know, I think we, we have a tendency to overstretch a little truth and, and just magnify what we think is its benefit. Uh, and maybe people are looking at Elisha and Elijah and the exchange of mantle. Paul saying that he had laid hands on on Timothy and, and, and the elders laid hands on him and there was uh, gifts imparted to him. Uh, we, we look at those things and begin to assume that the leader has gifts to give and then it's their prerogative to determine who gets it and who doesn't get it. I mean, when we think like that, it's almost as if we don't read the Bible. If you read the Bible, the most unlikely people are the ones who get it. Uh, the, the person next to the line doesn't get it. The person favor doesn't get it. And God just picks the people he wants. So uh, to think that somebody has a blessing to give to you and, and, and that if he doesn't give it to you, you cannot be what God wants you to be, is to deny the sovereignty and the awesomeness of God's power and purpose uh, in our lives. Elisha had served Elijah for about 20 years. And the impartation didn't take place when that mantle fell. It it came from 20 years of instruction and learning. And that is why he could catch uh, what he had to catch. Uh, And and apart from that, remember, God had told Elijah to anoint Elisha in his stead. So in God's mind, Elisha was the person he was going to choose to replace Elijah. So there was a divine dimension there. It wasn't Elijah just arbitrarily blessing Elisha with his mantle, so to speak. God had determined who would be the successor. And the faithful service to help. And the faithful service. He paid the price to be that. Do you think that there is an overemphasis on impartation rather than trying to draw from God and all that? Yeah, I, I, I think one of the mindsets we have inherited in the Pentecostal charismatic world is the miraculous. And and because we've encountered God at the miraculous and the supernatural level where things take place instantaneously, like a healing would take place uh, or some miracle would take place, we, we then stretch it to make it feel as if everything else in our lives must take place in the same way. I believe that there are things that take place miraculously and there are things that take place with process. And and I I think we overstretch this impartation uh, and and anointing and mantles that that must be passed on. I mean, it's not my prerogative to determine whom God is going to use. 
it's not my prerogative to impart mantles. If God hasn't chosen the person, you just get a handkerchief on, in his hand and, and that's all. You probably blow his nose. But it, it will be of no spiritual significance to him because God rules in the affairs of men and he chooses what he wants to do. It only becomes effective when my actions are in line with God's purposes. This is time with Pastor Otabu exploring the subject of the African church with specific emphasis on spiritual fatherhood. We are getting to understand what the rules are from the scriptures. And when we come back from this break, we have so many more questions we'd like to ask. Please don't go away. The entrance of the word brings light and understanding. Experience the ministry of Pastor Mensa Otabil throughout the week. Join us live this and every Sunday for a life-transforming service online, on air and in person at ICGC Christ Temple. First service is at 7.30 to 9 a.m. and the second service at 10 a.m. to 11.15 a.m. Receive inspiration and direction from Pastor Mensa Otabil every morning on Word to Go at 5.30 a.m. Don't miss time with Pastor Otabil on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Bringing a scriptural perspectives to the salient issues of life. Enrich your Christian walk with a living word broadcast on radio and television. Find us at centralgospel.com, at Mensa Otabil, and at ICGC Christ on Facebook, YouTube, and at my ICGC app at Schedule Times on TV and radio. Welcome back to Time with Pastor Otabil in our discussion about spiritual fatherhood. And I hope you've invited somebody, called somebody to join the discussion as we learn and as we grow in the faith and in the things of God. Mr. Priscilla? Doc, we want to look at ministry philosophy. The fact that every ministry or house has its philosophy and emphasis. The question is, how does a minister align him or herself with the philosophy of the ministry, flow with the DNA of the house, and maintain their unique calling? Your question has several (laughs) layers of uh, issues that... I think need to be addressed, and that is coming from the historical development of the charismatic movement. And I said it, I think, two programs ago, that the charismatic movement started with a ministry philosophy. So, and the ministry philosophy was personal. God calls a person, gives him a ministry, and he builds an organization around it. It could be called... Uh, T.L. Osborne Ministry, Maurice Sorello Ministry, Billy Graham Ministry, uh, Catherine Coleman Ministry. You, you see that the, the common denominator is that there is one person and the organization is built around their gifting and everybody else there is subject to that gift and helping that gift to be seen. And that is how we have seen uh, this development. And because the charismatic church is evolved from a ministry culture. We think of church also as ministry. So, and and that is one of the most important transitions we must cross because we have built churches, but we run them with a personal ministry philosophy. Now, I'm saying that because the whole idea of the DNA of a church or a ministry, um, if it is broadened, you know, if you look at the, 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 the church, the early church, they, they say that we're submitted to the apostles' doctrine. They didn't say to Peter's doctrine. Uh, but So it was a, a collegial development. Now, it takes time for that to happen because most of the time God calls a person and the person grows and develops and then others come to join. Um, But at a certain point, there has to be an effort, a real deliberate conscious effort to broaden the philosophy of the church beyond its founder and include the other ideas that are coming on board. So that when we we talk about the the philosophy of a ministry, it shouldn't be just one person's philosophy. The the philosophy of ICGC shouldn't be men's autobus philosophy. Yes, I have a very important role to play and and a very foundational role to play. But as the church grows, some will come to add. 
And so in the end, you have something bigger than just what men suitable taught. That is how we build enduring institutions. So at the formative stage, the problem you're talking about may occur, where a church is now establishing its identity and, and its ministry philosophy. So at that point, there is almost like one way of seeing it. Now, if you joined at that point, if you were a pastor and you joined at that formative stage, then you, you, you have to find a way to accommodate that. Even if you could help expand it, you have to adapt before you amend. You know, you, you have to be in to help to amend, to broaden. And, and, but you don't go and instantly from the outside try to broaden it. You, you, you're going to rupture the system and nobody will tolerate that. So, I, yes, we, we can build after the pattern of the philosophy. Um, and the third issue I want to raise with your question has to do with unique ministry. I think that is also uh, remnant from our formative <laughs> stage, where everybody thinks, or most people think of their ministry before they think of the church. And so they are always looking for their expression and not the growth of the church or the, of the larger body. Uh, because charismatics tend to raise the personal above the corporate. And if we continue to do that, our movements will be one generational movement. It, it will have no future. Because the corporate is always survives the personal. What are the rules of engagement if a pastor serves a ministry for some years and he feels, or he or she feels he has a, a pioneering call and wants to move on? I mean, there, there was a time when I feel that these things were happening. My wish, my prayer, my desire is we learn to be in systems, help to expand it, help to amend it, help to make it more accommodating, uh, and grow its capacity. Uh, otherwise, the, our movement will be very linear. And when people can't fit into that small space, they move away. They go and build a system like that, and pretty soon people can't fit into their system, and they move away. So it's a system that is constantly breaking up. And, and we break up to our own disadvantage. We have to consolidate. And, and so I would wish that it doesn't happen. But should that become an unavoidable necessity, I, I would say that it should be done cordially and it should be done uh, as Christianly as possible. That would mean that uh, you talk to the leadership that you are part of, explain uh, to them, and hopefully they will be gracious enough to say, although we would wish you would stay, uh, we give you the right hand of fellowship to go and do what you want to do. But, but Doug, is there a scenario where somebody is serving already in a, in, a, in a ministry, but there's an evident assignment that God is calling the person to do something, not necessarily opposite what he, where he was in, but some kind of... Um, um, I think that mindset has to change. You know, if somebody is a Catholic, the Catholic Church, we have to think about it. They've been there for over 1,700 or so, so years. Um, and he feels he wants to do something. Would he break away? He would work within the system because they, help, they have helped to grow the system. So there are different orders, different expressions, different spaces for people to work in. The desire for new things, expands it instead of narrowing it. And that is where we have to get to if we're going to build viable, enduring legacies. Otherwise, anytime somebody feels he can't fit into something, they leave. And, and so the organization never has the chance to accommodate, to expand, to amend, to engage, to, to become resilient, to, to, to be able to grow its capacity. It will always be narrow because anybody who doesn't fit in 
can't fit in. And then, dog, it, be, it behoves that the, the, the person who wants to move out and the organization must be able to understand themselves that this is not the way to go, but this is, there should be a compromise and that kind of thing. That would be my wish, yeah. that we build large capacity churches that can have all sorts of expressions in it and each one finding a role to play that is useful and that is beneficial to the larger organization. In the end, it enriches the organization. That, that means the church founders have to stop being narrow-minded and be broad-minded and know that as much as they were used to start something, their idea is not the beginning and the end of what they are building. There will come others who would help to expand uh, beyond what they have achieved. Doc, it would seem that this is at the heart of several of the charismatic breakaways that we spoke about the last time. It is, it is. I, I, I think um, it is a philosophical transition that we are not managing well. And it's worldwide. It's not just in Ghana. It's even in the United States, um, in other parts of the world. Uh, so the, the movement is becoming just single generation movement because uh, it, it, it doesn't have the flexibility to embrace things that do not line up immediately with what they think they stand for. Definitely one of the things that will be very difficult to reconcile is doctrine. If there's a fundamental difference in doctrine, it will be very difficult to reconcile. Of course, if somebody comes and says he doesn't believe Jesus is Lord, how are we going to accommodate him? <laughs> he doesn't believe Jesus was born of a virgin. How are you going to accommodate him? Uh, he doesn't believe that salvation is by faith in Christ Jesus. I mean, th those are totally non... I mean, you can't accommodate that. You can't make room for that. But if somebody says, uh, Pastor Otabel's ministry uh, is, is a teacher, uh, but I have a prophetic uh, gift. Yes, I should be able to accommodate it. <laughs> yeah, or uh, somebody says, I, I feel I have a healing ministry. I should be able to accommodate it. I can't say that everybody uh, should function like me. Uh, that, that, that would be narrow-mindedness. Interesting. Let's move on to the issue of Anna. So... First Timothy 5.17 recommends that elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. How does one practically communicate this honor to your pastor? And which types of honor must the pastor decline to accept? The phrase there is double honor. It didn't even just say honor them, but double honor. That means to highly esteem them. High esteem comes from just your, your own appreciation of a person, your evaluation of the person. So if I say I, I highly esteem somebody, it means that in terms of where I place the person, they are high on my reckoning, and, and I value them. I value what they say. I value my relationship with them, and I value their contribution to me. But the early church had a very peculiar problem, and the peculiar problem they had was they had transitioned from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and the Old Testament had its priesthood which was the Levitical order and the Aaronic order. And they were the only ones who were materially taken care of by the congregation. So in the Old Testament system, if you weren't a Levite or an established prophet, you, you had no access to be supported materially. So the church started and there was no philosophy for how do you support the people who are doing the work of God? Paul is preaching. How do you support him? He's not a Levite. Peter is not a Levite. How do you support them? So you find that in the writings of the New Testament um, apostles, they, they're correcting this and establishing new rules for supporting people that God has called. Who, uh, so it's applying the principle of the Levite without the order of the Levite. So Paul would say, threats out the, 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 the farm, is, must, must partake of, of what it is uh, threading out. So th this, this is what they are saying. They are saying that the, the pastors who are dedicated themselves in the early church, they are to be honored just like the Levites were honored 
in the previous system. So that, that's what they're, they're, they're trying to do, to create a new framework for supporting those who commit themselves uh, to the work of God. And, and, and said they deserve double honor. That means they deserve to be remunerated and be remunerated very, very well. Where does it go overboard that the pastor must say, no, this is not acceptable? As far as I've been a pastor, I've never asked for salary. I've never asked for salary increase. I have never asked for the church to do buy me a car or do anything for me. Um, I, I feel that uh, people must do what they feel you are worth. And really, it's a way to, to judge how people <laughs> value you if they think you are worthy of this or not worthy of that. And, and um, I go by the rule of Jesus. When you go wherever, whatever is given to you, that's what you take. You don't ask questions. You don't fight. You just do the work of God and, and receive what is given to you. But that doesn't mean people should be stingy and, and punish pastors sure. and, <laughs> and make them live very, very substandard lives. Uh, because I, I have situations where pastors cannot take care of their children and, and uh, they can't pay their bills. They, they can't rent a home. And, and sometimes they, they are very much appreciated in ministry but the congregation hasn't learned that they have to also take care of this person who is taking care of them spiritually. So the but then it's the important. duty of the pastor to teach them. Yeah, he has to teach in it. In uh, the, 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 the thing is sometimes when you teach these things, then people think you're teaching it for children motives. So it becomes a very difficult uh, thing to teach. You have to teach it objectively, just lay down the rules and hope that people will be sensible enough to know uh, that... Uh, the laborer is worthy of his high, as, as the apostle Paul taught us. Elisha stood at Jordan and said, where is the God of Elijah? Eli, Elijah? Is it wrong for an associate minister or spiritual mentee to invoke the God or the grace that is upon a senior minister? That's a very nice question, <laughs> Pastor Eric, um, because I, I hear that a lot. Yes. There, there are two dispensation, major dispensations in the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And when you read the Old Testament, you'll find that the God of the fathers is, is spoken about. So when God appears to Moses, he says, I'm the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, even Abraham, who is the father of the faith, God will say, I took you from your fathers. So the whole idea of the fathers and, and their relationship with God becoming the basis of, the, of our relationship was established in the Old Testament. So you will find that reference a lot in the Old Testament. When you come to the New Testament, Jesus changed that system. So he says, when you pray, you say, our Father who art in heaven, not the God of Abraham who art in heaven, or the God of Isaac who art in heaven, or the God of Elijah, or the God of Mesa Otabel. It is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Father. And, and so the, the concept of the New Testament is the general fatherhood of God in the life of the believer. Whereas the Old Testament says you relate to God because of the relationship your fathers had with him. So you, you see that concept very clearly in the Old Testament and then you come to the New Testament uh, and it's our, our father. So Elijah Sha said, yes, the God of Elijah. But in this era, whose God am I going to appeal to? Who is not my God? Our Father. Father, in the name of Jesus, is sufficient for all prayer. Wonderful note on which to go for another break. And while we are on break, you can literally say my God or my father and say a short prayer because when we come back from this break, it will be a couple of more a couple more questions to ask Pastor Tebo, and then it will be time to ask your questions that you sent after last week's very, very instructive discussion on spiritual fatherhood. Please don't worry. The entrance of the word brings light and understanding. Experience the ministry of Pastor Mensa Otabil throughout the week. Join us live this and every Sunday for a life transforming service online, on air, and in person at ICGC Christ Temple. 
First service is at 7.30 to 9 a.m. and the second service at 10 a.m. to 11.15 a.m. Receive inspiration and direction from Pastor Mensa Otabil every morning on Word to Go at 5.30 a.m. Don't miss time with Pastor Otabil on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. bringing us scriptural perspectives to the salient issues of life. Enrich your Christian walk with a living word broadcast on radio and television. Find us at centralgospel.com, at Mensa Otabil, and at ICGC Christ on Facebook, YouTube, and at my ICGC app at Schedule Times on TV and radio. Welcome back to Time with Pastor Otabil. A very insightful discussion about spiritual fatherhood in the context of the African church. And the number on your screen is the number to send your questions to so Pastor Otabil can give it his attention in our next episode. Pastor Eric? Doc, what are your thoughts on Psalm 105, verse 15, that says that, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm? Psalm 105 is narrating Israel's transition in the wilderness. And God says that when they were in the wilderness, this was what he said, or this was his protection for them, that they would not be attacked. So he says, touch not my anointed. And in the context that he, that verse is particularly using it, the whole nation was seen as the anointed uh, because they had been redeemed from Egypt. And so God says, no one can touch them. And you can touch their leaders. The prophets there was the leadership. You can touch them too. So this is from, for the outside world dealing with the inside situation. Does that have application now? I believe that every human being must be respected. And I also believe that clergy should be respected and should be honored and should not be unnecessarily attacked for whatever purpose. Um, But I do not think that this verse can be used to protect abusers. So if somebody has committed an offense and it's being brought to the notice of the person, it is not a touching of the anointing, uh, of the anointed. So I, I think it's, it's basically how it is used, uh, especially when it is used just to keep people quiet so that they can't speak their minds about something they don't understand. So how do you handle an issue when a pastor is in error and probably he's the head pastor, and he's an organizing. How do you handle such a thing? So let's say Pastor Table is in error. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and, and he's teaching something that is self-evident scripturally to be wrong. I would expect that my presbytery will sit me down and go through the scriptures with me and tell me that uh, we don't think this is right and help me to explain myself and and, and deal with it. And that would not be touching the anointed. That would be seeking for clarification. It would almost seem that for those who do not have such a governing body to work with, they will be handicapped because there will be nobody to speak to them. Oh, I, I think everybody has somebody they respect. You know, if, even independent pastors, they have somebody they respect. So somebody may not be in ICGC or may not be in Action Faith or may not be in uh, Lighthouse or some other church. But they respect some of these leaders. So if something is going on in their church, they can appeal to some of the leaders to say, you know, this is what our pastor is teaching. Uh, what do you think about it? And, and get second opinion. And maybe they can go and talk to, uh, to these leaders. So last week, we got quite a number of questions coming in after the invitation. So Pastor Priscilla, set us on our way. Yeah, so I have Petra Asamoah from Accra. She says, we've heard people ask the question, who is the spiritual authority over your life? Ostensibly referring to one's pastor. The question is, is this statement scriptural? Isn't it enough to be under the covering of Christ? <laughs> Christ himself gave gifts to men. Uh, so if, if Christ thought that people didn't need spiritual oversight, then he would have gone to heaven and would not have given gifts uh, to the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, pastors, and and, and people who oversee the flock. So every shepherd functions 
under the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. He's the authority. Uh, so if somebody says your pastor is your spiritual authority, I will understand it in the narrow sense that the church being a spiritual body, the head of that particular local church being the pastor, in that sense, he's your spiritual uh, head. Uh, does that mean that everything of your spiritual life depends on that person? That would be overstretching the truth. Uh, we have a relationship with Christ and, and with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit lives in every believer. And we don't serve God through our pastors. We serve God uh, through Christ. So it, it's just how some of these verses can be, or statements can be overstretched. Charles McCarthy says that, Pastor Ottawa, please, what is the difference between a father in faith and a spiritual father? I, I don't know what Charles' thinking is, but I think I explained it a, a little bit, you know, that the fathers in faith are the people who have communicated the Christian message strongly to us. Uh, they are historical. Some of them come from thousands of years, from after the early apostles, uh, through our church history. Some of them are very contemporary. Uh, it's, it's just a, a, a title of honor you give to somebody that you think has paid his dues and has served well, and, and so you, you say that he's a father in the faith. It doesn't mean that all of us then become his sons in the faith, but it's just it's, it's a term of endearment that he's a father in the faith. I, a spiritual father in the way that most people use it, I suppose is when they think that you have a, somebody who is your mentor who oversees you and counsels you and, and advises you. Dr. Elliot and Tema stays with nomenclature and he says Pastor Sebo, Jesus in John 13 verse 33 and Apostle John in 1 John 2 verse 1 uses the, or use the phrase little children in addressing believers how do you interpret that in the light of this discussion, little children that's a brilliant question uh, Jesus Christ used little children when he was talking to his disciples uh, about going dying and, and, and going to heaven and they were fallen. They, they were disappointed, discouraged. So at that point, just at that point, he says, he addresses them as little children. And, and the impression I get is almost like a parent telling his children, listen, I will come back. I'm going, but I will come back. Uh, but then later on, when you look through the verse, he still comes back that they are his disciples. So when we are establishing a spiritual or scriptural pattern, you have to look at the general principles and make it the normal. You don't take an exception and make it the normal. So this is just one situation. Jesus is about to go. He's talking to them about his death. They are fretting and he's calming them down and he calls them little children. It doesn't mean at that time Jesus is their father. He didn't say because just by calling you little children, I have become your father. Because he always pointed them to your father, my father, your father, my father. So that, that's it. Uh, John also used little children. But John used it in terms of spiritual maturity. So the writing of John, uh, he talks about, I write to you little children. I write to you young men. I write to you fathers. So he's talking about the different levels of maturity in the church. Uh, but he was not saying uh, that the entire church had become little children. That's, that's not what he's saying. But he's saying that in the church there are different levels of, of growth and maturity. John from Dan Suman says, What should an individual who now feels liberated after these discussions do to get out of a manipulative an abusive relationship with a spiritual father. What should you do? Knowing something does not mean that you apply it validly. So people have to know something for themselves, understand it, and, and find ways of bringing up the conversation. I, I suppose, let's say, somebody has a relationship with a so-called spiritual father, um, and they feel this is an oppressive situation, especially for me if it is a woman and has a relationship with a so-called spiritual father that is now not fatherly. Uh, 
and, and she wants to break it. I mean, if there is an abuse there, you don't need permission. Walk out. But if it's a doctrinal difference or just a preference a style of ministry, then create conversation. And yes, the leader may not welcome you the first time, but gain their confidence and start introducing the conversation. And who knows? They, they may come to appreciate the point that uh, you are raising. But if it, an abuse continues that de- diminishes your value, then at a certain point you have to decide for yourself uh, the next step you have to take. Right. Abba in Cape Coast says that Ephesians 6 1 says, I saw children to obey their parents in the Lord. Is there a brother sense to parents beyond biological parents? Does that include spiritual parent figures? I mean, there is a parallel of spiritual truth. Uh, so, but in the immediate context, it's biological parent. But there are spiritual leaders, uh, people who have spiritual oversight of us that we can find a way to accommodate that verse uh, in it. It simply means for somebody who is senior to you, who is an elder to you, honor them. You know, and I don't need to call somebody a spiritual father to honor him. I, I, I honor a lot of uh, older Christians. Some I came to meet on the scene uh, and some nobody knows, but I honor them. Uh, so, and I don't call them the, my spiritual fathers, but They've worked hard. They've done something for God. They are older, and we have to honor them. So we we honor people not simply because they carry a title of spiritual father, but because we think that they they have done something that must not be forgotten, and and we must remember to to make them feel that their labor was not in vain. Doc, Stella from our she would like to clarify, pastors who have literally adopted people as their children and care for them, as if they were their own biological children. She's asking, do these um, rules that govern relationship apply to them as well? And that's a little different. Uh, I think it, it comes with the terrain when you are a pastor in our part of the world. Invariably, you become also a foster parent and uh, some sort of a surrogate parent to people because we don't have social systems People can't pay their fees. People are abandoned. Parents are not responsible. Uh, There are widows uh, in the church. And uh, there's so much need in the church. So the the pastor's home uh, accommodates all of us. I mean, there are all kinds of people come to live with you. You take care of them. You help them. And some don't live with you. They are in the church. Some sleep in the church. uh, And and you help them through school. And they go on. And, I mean, every pastor does it. I mean, it's, it's... it's just a part of, of the life of a pastor in our part of the world. Um, is that spiritual fatherhood? I would not think so. I think I would say it's foster parenting. It's, uh, you, you're taking care of, it's a need, and, and you're taking care of people. Uh, and most of them, you know, grow up and, and go and live their own lives. They, they go on to university, get a good job, marry, and move on. It would seem that for people like that, out of a sense of gratitude, calling a pastor a father or a mother will be something that is almost natural without yeah, any yes, abuse. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, there, there are many people who call me uh, their father, daddy, dad. Um, I can't help it because, <laughs> <laughs> because of the kind of relationship we've had. A, but, you know, it, I'm, I'm, I understand that. I'm just saying let's not formalize it to become a general relationship between a pastor and his congregation. There will be individuals who, for whatever reason, call you mommy or daddy or whatever term of endearment to establish that you've helped them before, uh, but don't make it a formal uh, relationship as if they owe you for the rest of their lives uh, uh, in that sense. Doc, as you sign off on this particular dimension of the discussion, my mind goes to the fact that any time we deal with an issue, we place another block in the building process. Can I ask a question? How do we safeguard the sanctity, the integrity, and the continued relevance of the African church in the face of some seemingly insignificant practices that find themselves in the church, but which could have far-reaching implications if not attended? I mean, that's what we are talking. Uh, I mean, the conversation has to come up. We have to talk about it. We have to examine it. We have to evaluate it. 
And if we have to amend it, we amend it. I mean, I mean the conversation is so important. It's so important to talk about things of this nature. And we don't talk about it to condemn people or to, uh, uh, you know, to accuse somebody or to charge somebody. We're just bringing up this conversation simply because we need to talk about it. And conversation is the first point. And when we start talking, we develop the vocabulary to even express the kinds of things we want to say. Because there are times we want to say things and we don't have the vocabulary for them. So now when somebody talks about spiritual father, you, you're going to ask, in what sense, what do you mean by that? So the vocabulary is going through some change. And before you realize, the basis of conversation is established and then we can bring about some change. I, I believe that the church will do well. And the good news is that it's all being done in the light of scripture. As much as possible. I mean, a lot of it is also cultural, uh, but we have to address them, uh, whether it's a philosophical uh, question or it's a scriptural question, has to be honestly addressed as much as possible. I want to say a big thank you to you, Pastor Tabo, for today's very insightful conversation. Thank you. Thank you to you, Pastor Ray, for your contribution. You kept laughing at a lot of the <laughs> I'm sure you're just enjoying the unfolding. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Priscilla. Thank you. Too. What would you say to this? A lot of light <laughs> has been shed. Wow. No, it's almost as if darkness is being dispelled. Yeah. Many have followed this series very intensely, and they still do. What would be your closing thoughts to our viewers on this subject? You know, I'm, I'm, I try to address pastors, and, and for pastors who are on their own, and when I say on their own, uh, you had a call of God, you started a ministry or a church, uh, and it's growing, and you're trying to find out how do I build this uh, and how do I make it stand. Sometimes the challenge of that is you're not even sure what example to follow and who is your example, because sometimes we hail people and hallow them in a light that uh, doesn't reflect the totality of what we should know to do. So I, I hope that uh, if you are in that stage, that you would really spend time praying and seeking God's face to give you clarity as to where he wants to take you and your ministry. For those who are already pastors in established churches, uh, work with your churches. Work through it. Unless there is something extraordinary that requires extraordinary action, uh, try and work with your church. Uh, help to expand it, help to grow it, help to grow the base so that ch the church will not be narrow-minded and very insular. Uh, it will not be good for the church itself. All of us need to grow and accommodate. And, and for those of us whom God has graced to found churches and to lead them, uh, that God will help us to transition the church beyond our person into an institution that is big, bigger than each one of us. And may the Lord grant us the wisdom as we navigate this very difficult path. In Jesus' name, amen.